Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Alison Dupman. I am the incoming uh, president of Foresight Institute. I've been with the Institute now for, oh my God, I think six years. But whenever I say the number, um, I realize, oh my God, that number is updating <laughs> since I last said it. I can't just use the same number. So it's probably more. It's probably six by now. So it's been, it's been a while. Um, and yeah, Foresight has been around for 34, 34 years now, um, trying to advance beneficial technologies uh, for the long-term benefit of life. And um, yeah, we have focused on nanotechnology, bio and AI, but uh, I think our, um, our kind of like view is quite, is quite wide and we have to definitely create the ecosystem in which those technologies can flourish, which is why I'm so excited about the talk today, which is trying to do exactly that. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the current crisis was definitely a, at first a shock, but then also this, you know, incredible opportunity, I think, to A, kind of like create a connection and not just virtual connection or more connection but like actually connection with that is uh, that is i think quite personable you know we all see into each other's living rooms and kitchens and whatnot i think that's really nice i've seen many of you know every morning and uh, to me it's been a very social time and uh, secondly uh, this salon is definitely here to feature projects that are in need of support to um, fight COVID-19, um, like uh, to, to uh, alleviate uh, immediate problems with COVID-19 uh, and to help people make sense of it. So we had a lot of, kind of like, uh, let's say, mental and physical support uh, uh, groups as well and tips what you can do. And then lastly, and maybe a little bit more ambitiously and definitely something that I'm super excited about is how can we use this as an opportunity to uh, think a little uh, bigger and think a little bit more ambitious about kind of the um, the ecosystem that we want to put in place um, from here on. So um, it's not really a tabula rasa at all, but um, I think still, you know, like this crisis definitely gives us an opportunity to um, kind of like reevaluate and take a step back. And uh, I'm really thrilled to have Mark here today. We've had him, I think, last year for a salon on Charter Cities, which um, was already, I think, um, uh, a topic of high interest back then. But I think now, especially, uh, kind of like given that the um, Kind of like let's say the suboptimal functioning of some of our institutions uh, comes into comes into view uh, quite uh, quite prominently across the world, uh, and people are wondering which which work better and which uh, uh, which fail. I think it's a really good time to be experimenting with this a little bit more and to be pushing for it. Um, and so I'm super thrilled to have Mark here today. Um, I will um, lead. Uh, I will share a little bit more about his bio, which is quite extensive, but. Um, in a nutshell, he has uh, been kind of like leading uh, the Charter Cities Institute uh, now for a while, and it's, uh, I think it, he's really doing a fantastic uh, job at kind of squaring this really ambitious um, idea and kind of like this ambitious plan um, of actually trying to kind of like uh, reinvent and, and, and kind of like dissect uh, our, uh, our current institutions, um, uh, which is a really ambitious goal, but also trying to, um, you know, make that... Uh, uh, make it attractive uh, to uh, to I think the current policy environment, and I think that's you know that's a really hard bridge to build, and I think you're doing a fantastic job at it, Mark. So I'm super thrilled for what you're going to share with us, and uh, I think I'll give the stage to you. I'm going to take questions in the chat, um, and then I'll queue the questions, and after you're done talking, we'll do a little bit of a Q and A. Does that sound good? Um, oh, great! All Thank right. you. I assume that sounds good to everyone. All right, with that, uh, I will share your bio and uh, the stage is yours. Cool. All right, then well, let me pull up my uh, deck uh, screen share. Perfect, working. Uh, um, let's start the slide show. Okay, so um, I guess, uh, right, I'm not exactly sure what the, the audience is. This is a little bit of a new experience for me, as I imagine there's lots of new experiences that people are having with, with COVID. So I'll, I'll start by giving sort of a high level overview and explanation understanding. Um, I'm Mark Letter, I run the Charter Cities Institute. Uh, a, we're a nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. that is trying to basically promote charter cities. And we, we have two functions. One is we operate as a think tank. So we have a podcast that we launched recently. We had a conference that we had to cancel three weeks ago, which was a bummer. Um, and we're putting out a bunch of sort of papers and uh, stuff about charter cities. And a charter city is a, a new city with uh, a special jurisdiction that allows for a more competitive business environment. 
And so in, in addition to uh, acting as a think tank, we also um, act as technical consultants on the ground, uh, which means that we basically assist with new city developments to help them improve their legal systems. Currently we're working in uh, Zambia and, and Nigeria. Um, and so I start with this quote, make no, ma make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. Um, because I think that, uh, I don't know, ambition seems to be less than it was 100 years ago. Daniel Burnham is an architect. He designed the Fat Iron Building in New York, as well as the urban plan for Chicago, uh, Manila, a few other cities. Um, and this is sort of relates to the broader, like, Thielian point about um, lack of innovation, lack of uh, ambition in society. Even if you look at Silicon Valley, which is one of the most innovative places, uh, a lot of the work focuses on basically new SaaS companies. And I have nothing against SaaS companies per se, but just creating a, a new calendar app um, isn't that exciting. And if that's the most innovative part of society, then I think we need to start um, dreaming bigger. And so we uh, define charter cities as basically having four important components. Uh, a greenfield city, a new city development on uninhabited land, um, an independent administration. So this means that there is a new administrative entity that is created that governs uh, exclusively the city, the devolution of authority uh, to the city level. And what this means is that there's typically authority that's reserved at the national level, things like labor law, business registration, um, tax administration that are then devolved to the city administration. And lastly, dispute resolution, having a separate dispute resolution um, mechanism in the city that's not dependent on the uh, courts in the rest of the country. And so why is this um, important? There have been uh, historically some sort of charter cities efforts like seasteading, uh, competitive governance that have focused on pushing the frontier. So how do you make the best institutions better? Um, and while we think that's definitely a valuable goal, um, we've decided to focus on emerging markets for basically two reasons. One, uh, there are over 70 million new urban residents annually, 78 million actually, um, which means that there's a demand for new cities. People are building new cities and these new urban residents are concentrated in Africa and Asia. The second reason for focusing on emerging markets um, is just that we believe there's more political appetite in emerging markets for these relatively radical um, reforms than in high income countries. Uh, I think it's unlikely, for example, that the US government will um, devolve taxing authority or labor law to a new city development while in um, some of the projects we're working with that does seem to be a very real possibility within uh, the next uh, few years. Uh, the, the third sort of reason to, to focus on emerging markets is just the potential benefit from these regulatory reforms is much higher. Um, for example, if somebody from Bangladesh moves to the US, their income increases about 5x. And that 5x increase in income is largely because of uh, the, the um, legal environment in which they operate. And so if you build a charter city in an emerging market, you can easily imagine 5, 10, even 20x increases uh, in income over a 50 year period. Versus the US is relatively well governed, right? There's obviously a lot of things that can be improved, but all things considered it is um, relatively well governed. And so if you think about, okay, if we have a blank slate and create the best legal system from scratch, um, the change in income is, if you're very optimistic, 2x. Um, but a more realistic estimate is like 20, 30% increase in, in per capita income if you have a, a, a real like full-fledged charter city in the US. So that's why we are focusing on um, emerging markets. The, the second aspect, um, right, typically urbanization has a company industrialization. People move to cities, um, they have access to a larger labor market, they become more specialized and they get wealthy. It, this it happened in the US, this happened in Europe, it happened in China. This relationship has broken down in parts of the world, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, where people move to cities, but they don't see their productivity increase. So you basically have these massive cities. Lagos, for example, has um, 20 million people. It's, some projections have it reaching 80 million people, eight zero million by the end of uh, the century. And these people are moving to cities, but their productivity isn't increasing. So rather than moving to cities and right, watching your income grow, give your kids a better life, they're basically trapped in slums for multiple generations. So this is a serious problem, not only for the, the people living in these poor conditions themselves, but also sort of for the political stability of the, the host country as well as the um, uh, surrounding region. And so uh, here we have a, a map. This shows some of the um, economic growth in, in Africa. Uh, one of my favorite examples is 
um, Kinshasa. It's the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo. It has about 13 million people. It's bigger than Paris. There's a pop singer who sings about um, a kid who pees in a puddle and gets electrocuted because after storms, uh, uh, they knock down some of the power lines into puddles and kids pee in them and get electrocuted. And obviously this isn't a big, um, like a daily occurrence, but the fact that it's an occurrence enough to be mentioned in a pop song suggests just the level of um, dysfunction. And the city has 12 million people. It's as big as Los Angeles. And they're unable to, right, like keep power lines upright and not having them electrocute people. So that sort of illustrates the, I guess, magnitude of the, the challenge and, and scale. And because I think I, I want to open this up to, to questions and have a broader discussion, I'm going to quickly um, run through run through uh, some of these, these examples. So Singapore, um, uh, this is in the beginning of his book, uh, Lee Kuan Yew writes, I've not seen a book on how to build a nation out of a disparate collection of immigrants from China, British India, and the Dutch East Indias. Lucky, uh, luckily, Lee Kuan Yew wrote that book. It's called um, From Third World to First. It's um, uh, a great book, right? They, they started off with a per capita income of $4,000. Their potential major trading partner, Malaysia, was hostile because Malaysia kicked them out. Uh, they had about four years into their existence, the British decided to leave um, their naval base there, which was about 20% of their income. And now uh, Singapore is used to present the future, right? Westworld, the new season, they want to present like Los Angeles, I forget what year it is, like 2050 or something. And so what do they do? They go to Singapore to shoot it, um, to shoot the, 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 the uh, show. So they, they, one of the interesting aspects of, of Singapore is that when they became independent, they decided to continue to rely on the British Privy Council, um, British courts, which resolved disputes among colonies because they realized, look, we're a new country. We don't have this history of rule of law. Nobody is going to um, trust us. So they used the British Privy Council until the late 80s when they had some disputes and they were established enough to begin uh, using their own court system. Uh, Dubai is another great example. Um, this uh, quote from Sheikh Rashid, who is the sort of primary architect of modern Dubai. My grandfather rode a camel, my father rode a camel, I drive a Mercedes, my son will drive a Land Rover, his son will drive a Land Rover, but his son will drive a camel. And the point of this quote is to capture the ethereal, um, ephemeral nature of uh, the oil wealth. And Dubai, while they have a little bit of oil wealth discovered in 66, uh, it, their oil wealth doesn't compare to their neighbors like Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia or Qatar. So what they did was they invested a lot of that oil wealth in um, infrastructure, in electricity. In, in 1971, right, these uh, statistics, 30% literacy, no universities, life expectancy, 50 years. These are among the worst uh, countries in the world today, places like um, uh, Somalia. And Dubai was like this just in 1971. And 50 years later, it is one of the, uh, I don't know, shining cities of, of the world. So one of my favorite stories about Sheikh Rashid, he, he goes to um, um, uh, these camera booths when he's a kid. And most of, the, most of his friends are going to camera booths and what do they look at? Well, they look at pictures of pretty women because that's what you do when you live in a very conservative culture in the 1940s. What does he do when he goes to the, the sort of picture booths? He looks at pictures of London because he's inspired by the skyscrapers there and wants to replicate them in Dubai. Um, they have the tallest building in the Middle East in 1980, the tallest building in Europe in the year 2000, uh, the tallest building in the world in uh, 2010. And one of my the favorite examples is, is the Dubai International Financial Center because it shows that it is possible to create a legal system from scratch um, and what they did was they basically hired a top tier law firm and then brought judges from uh, common law countries because they realized that Islamic law is not exactly conducive to attracting international finance. They also managed to take advantage of sort of strategic missteps uh, of their regional um, competitors like Iran, which uh, had the tip, Tehran used to be the stopover point from uh, flights from east to west, um, Europe to Asia, and then the Iranian revolution changed that. So. Dubai takes advantage. Similarly, they take, uh, Lebanon used to be the financial capital and then they have a civil war. So again, Dubai takes advantage. Uh, let me quickly skip through Hong Kong and get to the um, end to leave. I was told to do like 15, 20 minutes. So what are the lessons? We see there as being basically six uh, important lessons. So You're free to go a little over if it makes sense. 
Feel free uh, to well, go a little over. Okay, well, I think th this is going to take another sort of five or six minutes anyway. So um, this this presentation was originally 40, 40 minutes, so that's why I'm, 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 I'm going through it a little bit quickly. Um, yeah, I think it's a good appetizer for people to ask questions about the slides too. Cool. Uh, so the, we, we sort of define these as being uh, six key lessons. Um, big capacity, governance, uh, location, urban planning, culture, and anchor tenant. So state capacity is basically, can the government um, execute effectively on projects? Uh, and we have obviously seen, I think uh, the, the pandemic has shown some countries with relatively high state capacity, the ones that have uh, managed to contain the, the pandemic to greater or lesser extents are largely in uh, East Asia, so Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, South Korea. And there is an argument to be made that uh, some of the preparation is because of their previous experience with SARS. And that's certainly true, but their governments have also just been, been much more effective. Well, we've seen some countries, the US, for example, has really uh, struggled to respond effectively. And so one of my favorite examples um, about state capacity is in the middle of the Great Depression, it took three years to build the Golden Gate Bridge um, in, the, in the late, uh, are we calling them oddies now, uh, like 2000s? Um, it took seven years to build the on-ramp to the Golden Gate Bridge, and I think it actually cost uh, more money too. And so another example, I, I lived in Honduras for six months, and I took a bus from Honduras to El Salvador, and the bus would only leave very early in the morning. Why? Because if it left later in the day, um, there were literal highway bandits who would rob you uh, when it got dark out when you were in uh, driving through the rural areas. So like, can the government uh, accomplish its basic tasks? Um, the second aspect is governance. Uh, so, right, this is a picture of North Korea and South Korea, um, and governance means like, what is the business environment? Is it easy to register a business? Is it easy to invest? Is it easy to hire people, to fire them? Is it easy to uh, resolve disputes? And can the city government affect, uh, uh, quickly adapt um, as the, the, the changes on the ground uh, continue? So governance also might be sort of the business environment, economic freedom is another term. Third is location. Uh, even if you have the best governance, even if you have the best state, if you build a city in Antarctica, nobody's going to want to live there. So where are people moving to new locations? What is the arbitrage, um, what is the opportunity that you're creating with the governance reforms compared to the surrounding region? And lastly, so how is the trade route uh, shifting? Right, we're seeing a lot of uh, ports, for example, being built up on the Horn of Africa in that area. Um, the urban plan, so cities are labor markets. They function because they allow people to um, interact with a much wider group of people. If you have cities that don't have effective public transportation, that limits the, 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 their, the, the size of their labor market. And a lot of, there's a lot of master plan cities being built uh, today around the world, over 200 by some estimates. These master plan cities tend to be poorly planned. So if you go to Dubai, right, Dubai is basically a giant highway with hotels on it. And each hotel is self-contained with like five or six restaurants. Um, but it's not really walkable. They do have a metro, but it, the, the, the daily ridership is relatively low. This is in part because of the environment of Dubai, but it's also in part just because of poor planning. Brasilia is another example. It was designed so that it looks like a plane from the sky, um, right? That's what the, the, the geographical layout of Brasilia uh, looks like. And that, again, like, why are you building a city that looks pretty from the sky? It should be functional for the people who live in it. Uh, so my favorite example of an effective urban plan is the New York Commission of 1811. They realized Manhattan was growing very rapidly and they needed a plan, so they just drew a grid. And the grid is, is they, here are public spaces, here are private spaces, and after defining the public and private spaces, they allowed for um, uh, uh, the order to emerge, and that, that defines uh, New York to this day. Um, they're building a new city uh, today, you need a little bit more planning because there's a much heavier, uh, much higher infrastructure investment uh, cost initially in terms of sewers, in terms of electricity, in terms of um, a port. And so you need a little bit more planning, but you still want to make sure you don't over plan like a lot of the master plan cities are today. Another example is um, how do you create like the culture of effective administration? So right, uh, many uh, charter cities have opportunities in countries that um, aren't very well governed. And so how do you right, create these sort of little pockets of um, uh, effectiveness when the broader culture is one of um, uh, not effectiveness? And then second, the other question is, right, how do you attract people? How do you inculcate the culture of the city as a whole such that the people in the city are inspired to build things, are inspired uh, to sort of be productive um, um, members of society? Lastly is the anchor tenant. So 
one of the challenges of a city is nobody wants to be the first person to move there. So uh, a joke I like to make is that there's three ways to build a city. You can be a government, and if you're a government, you can force um, your bureaucracy to move to a new city. So that is an example like Abuja in Nigeria, Brasilia in Brazil, um, Astana in Kazakhstan. Second is there can be an economic reason, and most cities are founded for economic reasons. A city might be on a trading route, so uh, there might be a good port, or there might be um, some avenue of trade that goes through that, and so it's a human settlement. Or there could be some resource extraction going on. So for example, many cities in Latin America were originally mining towns that then became, got enough people living there, got enough economic activity that even when the mine ran out, there, uh, uh, the city itself persisted. Um, the third reason is you can uh, start a religion. So the religion might be able to coordinate lots of people to move to an area in, um, in a, 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 to, to start a city, and that's something like Salt Lake City. So how do you get all the people to move to a new city? And the way to do this is an anchor tenant. This initial, um, basically, business that comes in, builds a factory, creates the first thousand jobs that then justify the investment in something like a small grocery store, a restaurant, a school, et cetera, that can begin to create the labor market to create that positive uh, spillover effect to uh, have the, 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 the further um, uh, investment and further growth. And so we think about the, the anchor tenant as being, right, it should be ideally, it, can, it doesn't have to be, but it should be plugged into the broader regional economy. So, right, what are the skills in that area? Um, how can you create these backward linkages with, with the greater economy? The, the alter, alternative, which um, depending on the stability of the host country, might be to, uh, right, like just to create a remote work city where people can work remotely. And so the city we're working with in, in Zambia is focusing on um, uh, developing tech talent to develop this sort of right, remote work. Why? Zambia is a copper economy, and so uh, they're, they don't want to be dependent on copper price fluctuations like the rest of the economy. Zambia is also landlocked, so it's much more expensive to export goods. And so if you export uh, relatively high value services, you can um, insulate yourselves from broader economic shocks. So the brief history of charter cities, uh, Paul Romer gives his TED talk in 2009. He has opportunities in Madagascar and Honduras, neither of them really go anywhere. Um, the Sea Study Institute uh, wanted to build autonomous floating cities. Um, and so what we're doing uh, to sort of pick up is uh, at the Charter Cities Institute is this broader um, engagement. So what we want to do is target the international development community because they care about economic growth uh, in emerging markets. We want to make sure that charter cities aren't dependent on single people or single countries. Because when Paul Romer sort of lost interest, a lot of the mainstream momentum for charter cities had been lost. And then there's been a handful of companies that went to Honduras um, because Honduras has charter cities legislation that's still on the books and weren't able to get traction. And so because of that, there's sort of this semi-lost knowledge. And we want to help institutionalize that to build out partnerships with a number of organizations to, to really uh, be able to ramp up. So there's a small growing community. Um, this is a picture from Nkwashi. It's the city we're working with in Zambia. The first residents were going to move in this year, but that might be slightly delayed because of COVID. It's 12 square kilometers for 100,000 residents being built outside of uh, Lusaka. Um, uh, Pronomo's capital is Patrick Friedman. He gave a talk, I think, last week with uh, Foresight. Um, and they're uh, doing early stage investments in, in charter cities. Um, in Yimba Economic City is a new city development in Nigeria that we're working with, 95 square kilometers, being built for uh, 1.5 million residents. Um, they've acquired the land and they were planning to submit to the Nigerian Export Processing Zone Authority for the decentralization of um, uh, governing authority to the city, but that's on hold as well because of uh, COVID. So um, let's make bold plans. To, to conclude, I think just uh, given that it's um, um, sort of in the news. I think the, the case for charter cities is still strong, um, regardless of COVID, right? People are still going to move to cities. If you look at um, London when it was booming in the 19th century at cholera, there was relatively little evidence that the uh, uh, Spanish flu pandemic changed urbanization rates. This might be a little bit different, but um, the fact is that these, these demographic trends aren't going away and people are going to move in cities, even if the rate is slightly less than it otherwise would have been. But the large implications I see is basically twofold. It's, well, I guess threefold. One, there's going to probably be a, a substantial shift to um, remote working, which probably benefits charter cities because that allows for uh, places like Nkwashi to, um, as the sort of culture and understanding of how to set, set up uh, remote work um, is built out, uh, cities like Nkwashi could benefit. The second um, major, I think, impact is going to be that 
uh, there's probably going to be a, a sort of sustained reduction in, uh, at the very least, the growth rate in international trade, if not international trade itself. And why? Because international trade is dependent on the U.S. basically patrolling shipping lanes. And we've seen in the last five, ten years, um, regional uh, conflicts have begun to emerge, for example, Iran, Saudi Arabia, you're seeing a, a, a new scramble for Africa with Russia, China, Turkey, um, France, all, all uh, the U.S. all getting involved. And so this sort of withdrawal of the U.S. defense umbrella, which um, I suspect COVID will accelerate because the, the just clear general lack of global leadership um, is going to lead to uh, basically new regional trading part patterns as uh, global trading routes are, are a little bit less secure than they were. And this isn't going to be an immediate impact, but we can likely see it over 10, 20 years, which is the timeline of, of most charter cities. Um, and then the third implication, I think, is going to be that a lot of emerging markets are dependent on natural resources, uh, particularly for tax revenue. And so as we've seen, uh, the commodity markets get hit very badly. Uh, oil prices are uh, rock bottom, copper prices are rock bottom, Zambia is in the middle of a debt crisis. Uh, these governments are going to look for alternative um, uh, revenue streams. And one of those revenue streams might be charter cities if they it can be packaged effectively as, look, here's a way to diversify away from natural resources because um, my guess is we're not going to see a V-shaped recovery. And so uh, commodity prices will probably be uh, uh, relatively low for the next two, three, four, maybe five years. Um, and so with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, feel free to email me. Uh, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, um, and I'll open up to questions now. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, I think, you know, like, uh, there's much to be said for like going through the slides uh, slower, I think, when, when people have the video uh, as well. It was quite dense. If you're willing, it would be amazing if you could share the uh, slide deck with me because I usually try to post them in the show notes, which is like on the sanity schedule so people can, can read up on it. Okay, great. Okay, cool. We have a lot of questions already queued. Um, so first one up is Liam. And Liam, I'm unmuting you right now. So have your question ready. Hi, Mark. Hi, Allison. Uh, thanks for hosting. Mark, I think you already talked about this a bit, but if you could, um, you know, historically, Estonia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Chile, um, all kind of came out of a crisis. Is there an archetypal crisis that you think would make nations receptive to starting city states? Are there different crises that you're kind of looking at and thinking would be that opportunity? Um, yes. A, a, a little bit. So I, I think first, um, I, I guess I would differentiate. We're, we're not looking to create um, city-states. Uh, these would remain within the sovereignty of the host country. So it's, it's um, our, our goal is economic development, and so that requires economic reforms, which don't necessarily require political reforms. So the sort of like examples in the modern world that are somewhat analogous to this are Hong Kong, where it's like one country, two systems, or Shenzhen, which um, was a special economic zone with a lot of um, regional autonomy. Uh, and right, this, this is very contextual, um, but generally, like I, I think that there's sort of several layers. One is, right, you can look at this as just a broad, like it's not really a new governance innovation because there have been right, like free cities as well as city states, even if charter cities are not city states for a lot of human history. But it is this sort of resurgence of a relatively older form of, of governance. And right, like that can be interpreted as just uh, right, um, a, a sort of move away from the dominant governance patterns of the, the 20th century, especially with the rise of China, and with the um, right, relative decline of the U.S., at least in terms of its productive capacity uh, compared to the rest of the world, the aging of Europe. And so I think that is going to lead to more um, willingness to accept these broader changes. The second, uh, I think, aspect to consider, if you look at historically uh, in Europe, um, there were charter cities, which were effectively tax farming arrangements. The, the, the central government was unable to uh, effectively collect taxes, so they would grant a charter to a city and say, look, you can govern yourselves, but you have to just send us some tax revenue um, once a year. And charter cities, uh, modern charter cities can be interpreted somewhat in that vein 
in that if you look at uh, tax collection rates in a lot of emerging markets, they tend to be relatively poor. Um, they only tax a small percentage of the population, sometimes even 10% or less, and they um, only tax a small percentage of businesses as well. So if there's a new administrative entity that is able to um, basically create economic activity, so one, grow the pie, and then two, to tax the pie more effectively, then a uh, government might be more willing to engage that particularly if they see their um, existing tax base uh, greatly shrink because of um, uh, uh, the, the decline in natural resource prices, as well as the fact that uh, I think we're also seeing right remittances have uh, declined uh, very sharply. Um, and there's probably going to be a, a, a decrease in uh, um, aid as well, at least an immediate decrease as countries are looking to repurpose aid budgets. France was uh, discussing this, repurposing their aid budget to Africa to fight uh, COVID. Oh, interesting. Great. Thank you. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So next one up, we have Atassa. And Atassa, I will unmute you right now. Hey, uh, hey, Mark, thanks for doing this. Uh, and Allison, thanks for organizing. Um, I was wondering about the intellectual history of the idea of the charter city. Um, I know you can trace it in any number of ways, but I guess for you and for your project, what, what is the genesis of this idea and, and what are the, the roots of it for you guys? Sure. So, I mean, my personal genesis, I can't, largely came out of what might be described as the techno libertarian space. Um, so, I uh, Right, I, I, I'm not, I don't really consider myself a libertarian anymore, but I, I did, when I, I got interested, I did not learn about the idea from Paul Romer. Um, I lived in Honduras after Romer had left when most of the groups involved were more um, analogous to the techno-libertarian side. Um, though I think, right, like going to graduate school, doing my PhD at George Mason, I think turned off some of my radicalness and has turned this into much more of a, um, pragmatic approach. And I think this has been seen uh, more broadly. Also, uh, Patrick Friedman, who I mentioned mm -hmm. previously, right, he started the Sea Study Art Institute, and now Pronomos Capital focuses on charter cities, and, and th their, their narrative is um, relatively similar as this um, mechanism for uh, uh, economic growth. So while my, my sort of history has been uh, via the libertarian space, um, it, it, I I, I don't really, I, I think that space has sort of like changed and we're, we're taking a, a very sort of pragmatic, um, what we, we don't believe is, is particularly ideological approach. I think the reforms that we are suggesting, um, at least in terms of like policy content, um, are largely influenced, for example, by the World Bank doing business index. Uh, and and I, I think are quite presentable um, uh, within, within most um, standard international development contexts. Thanks, that's really, uh... Good answer. Helpful. Thank you. And uh, Mark, I don't know if it's just me, but uh, maybe you stop sharing the screen. Uh, I can see you, but I think for, for the video that, that may oh, be good. No, okay. I, uh, oh, yeah, sure. I'll, so uh, cancel the screen so it's just me. Yeah, you can uh, you can click on top. You should There should be a, oh, a button that says stop oh. screen share or below where it said stop yeah, screen share. You can okay, click it. on stop screen share. Cool, thank Perfect. You. You're back. Great. Okay. Next one up, we have Apur, and I'm going to unmute you now, Apur. So uh, get your question ready. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, my, uh, Mark. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I'm just curious. Like, do you think this model can be evolved? Can you you see it evolve as a government as a government governance as a service model? Uh, yes, um, I think that it, it, it likely will, um, it, basically for two reasons. One, uh, I think right, if you have charter cities driven uh, via profit motive, and a lot of them will be because um, you need to invest hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to build the infrastructure, and so the investors will expect a return on that, and that will lead to much more of a right, like governance as a service versus this historic sort of more like, I don't know, nationalistic set of governance. Um, and then second, I suspect as the capabilities to effectively govern are built out, and you already see this, for example, with Estonia's um, e-governance program, where they, they have uh, a very easy incorporation from anywhere in the world, you're gonna yeah. see some of these services um, branch out to become, I think, 
um, not always sort of geographically centric, though I do believe that there is going to continue to be a um, importance of uh, uh, geographic um, proximity just because of, of how people live. Yeah, uh, thanks. So I have an, I have a, another question, which is like uh, uh, related to COVID nineteen. So like, do you, are you like thinking now like how resilience can be like embedded uh, since like the foundation of these charter cities, or are, is it relevant or not? I don't. I, I actually don't think that that's that important. Um, to me, the the like having a plan for COVID doesn't really help. Like it might help a little bit, but what actually helps is just being competent. And the problem is most Western governments are like just not competent today. Um, and so if you look, one of my favorite examples is in, in I believe this was 2015 or 2016, during the Ebola crisis in, in Liberia, there was a firestone of people. And so they were like, okay, there's a like uh, uh, epidemic outbreak. How do we deal with this? And they basically just Googled it and adopted relatively basic um, um, procedures where, okay, if some, like you, you sort of restrict entry and exit and make sure that people who enter uh, test and if anybody's uh, identified as, as positive, then you have to quarantine them and use the proper safety precautions. And because of this, in the middle of a, a epidemic with a, in a country with very low per capita income, they managed to avoid any deaths. And so, right, like if you actually think about what the, like there's always going to be some challenges, particularly in emerging yeah. markets where, um, Right, like the villages might not have water, uh, so it's hard to wash your hands. Or if you have three people in a room, social distancing is difficult. But sort of the general precautions that you have to take, like wear a mask, um, like wash your hands. Uh, these things you don't need a, a, a master, like a massive plan for that. I mean, even the, the sort of tracking and tracing technology, right, with 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 um, smartphones is relatively low cost. You just force everybody to download an app. Um, and use a right like have a sort of Bluetooth tracker where then if you're tested positive it can give the all the people who've come within six feet of uh, within the last two weeks and that's then given to the health agency that can then like contact those people and um, get them to test and quarantine until the test comes back either positive or negative. Yeah okay thank you. Thank you. All right great thank you Apoor and next one up we have Mike. Uh, so Mike I'm going to unmute you and then I think we can start curing people again. So if you have a question, feel free to ask in the chat and then I'll take you up after Mike. Uh, okay, Mike, you are unmuted now. Okay, thanks. Got a question on Honduras. And you might also know about French Polynesia. They were going to do the sea static. Last I knew in Honduras, they had a court decision which had blocked the charter cities, especially economic zones from taking place, did that court decision get overturned somehow so that now they can do the charter cities there? I suspect so. If the court decision you're referring to, um, there was a, a Supreme Court decision in 2011, I believe, that banned charter cities, or not banned them, but were the, the existing charter cities law and constitutional. Uh, about a year later, uh, similar legislation was passed that was re re ruled constitutional by the court. The court also had been reconstituted. All of the basically like liberal justices had been fired. They have a traditional left-right split because this is Honduras. So um, I don't know, politics are sometimes less than ideal. What I've read is that I've, I've seen insinuations that it was because of the Charter Cities legislation, though I don't believe that to be true. Um, I, I, my understanding is that it was because of uh, uh, the, the leftist justice is ruling on a um, police brutality case. But right, like whatever the case, um, they had this new legislation that was ruled uh, constitutional by the Supreme Court. That was in, I think, uh, legislation was passed in 2012 or 2013. Uh, and that's been on the books since. There is a committee called the Committee for the Adoption of Best Practices. There is at least one project I know of on the ground that um, uh, seems to be relatively advanced in their set of approvals. Uh, but the, the, the system is, is relatively um, chaotic. Uh, regarding French Polynesia, my understanding of what happened is they got the memorandum of understanding signed in, I think, 2017, 2018. And then they raised um, money, uh, did the, the studies, but um, the, the French Polynesians were, um, I think, reluctant to take it to the next step. Um, because of sort of political concerns. And I think that the, the sort of, I think there were also just challenges in terms of like the, the amount of money that they, 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 they raised and to be able to execute just because 
um, like if you're building a, a, even a, a sort of small floating um, um, like research lab, they're still talking about like at the, at the cheapest, like millions of dollars, if not tens of millions of dollars. Okay, yeah, it was last I knew in French Polynesia that France had to actually approve the legislation or the decision to allow the, the special economic zone. Yeah, I wondered if that had ever gotten approved or passed or. You know. Um, my, I, sorry, go for it. No, no, you, you go then. Alvin. My my understanding is that there is nothing on the ground in French Polynesia today. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wondered what. It, yeah. That I remember I went to the seasteading conference in French Polynesia, um, you know, the first one, I think, uh, just just after they had the memorandum of understanding signed. Um, and then, you know, it was, uh, I think it was quite a, an optimistic um, kind of like outlook for a while. Uh, but then also they had a governmental switch. And I think the party that then was uh, that then came to power made it kind of like their uh, kind of like opposition statement <laughs> that they were against what what the previous administration had had decided. So I I, I think uh, you you can Google that again, but that's I think what I um uh, what I uh, what I, what I discovered upon like a little bit of investigation. But yeah, I mean you know I think um you know even that is like is a really good test case for learning, right? You 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 need to go into uh, into uh, kind of like experiment with zones where you know where, where people are kind of like receptive to this like this is really hard man <laughs> this is like a really ambitious goal that's why I think the quote with that you started Mark resonates so much I think you know like I have really big dreams um okay I have one question uh, that um I know that you know we I think we briefly touched about it when you were for so long here the last time but I, I still uh, I am still kind of like want to push uh, push a little on it uh, do you think there's really no case to be made for doing a uh, charter city uh, like um, experiment in California, because there seems to be appetite for it, right? Um, and um, and there's land too, and you know, yeah. That, I, I, I mean, what's I think your there, what's your opinion? I, I think there is. I, I mean, it depends on what exactly right you mean by a charter city, but just in terms of building a new city that has more liberal zoning zoning laws, right? That could be very successful if it's within an hour and a half commute of the Bay Area. And I mean, like Y Combinator looked at this for a while. I've heard varying stories about why it, it didn't get off the ground. Um, I don't think that this would lead to, uh, like that, that it's realistic to get federal regulatory relief. So if the expectation is like the federal government will make it easier to do like medical innovation with drugs and medical devices, I don't think that's a realistic ask. Um, um, I mean, maybe it is because just like the nature of COVID has changed everything. Um, but I think there is uh, the, the, right, like, if you're doing it, like, the, the question in terms of a charter city is, like, what is the regulatory arbitrage? Because, like, you could build a city that's not a charter city, and that could have a lot of value. But, like, a charter city has this idea of, of regulatory reforms. And so in California, the only regulatory arbitrage that I believe is realistic, politically fe realistically politically feasible, though obviously conditions are changing very fast, is the um, zoning land use. All right, good. Um, uh, okay, next one up we have David. Uh, so I'm going to unmute David now, and then Apu had another question. Oh no, Sean, Sean, you go first. Sean, I'll unmute you now. <laughs> Are you in Puerto Rico, Sean? Uh, wait, wait, wait! Don't answer yet. Answer now, please. Sean, where are you? I am calling from Puerto Rico. Good to see everyone. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So I actually have a question about Puerto Rico. Um, but first, I want to start with uh, just trying to clarify. Um, you talked about charter cities uh, kind of as a concept and gave examples of other cities, but I kind of want to nail down, is there an existing charter, charter city? And like, how do we know, like, it sounds like a concept to me and I'm just trying to find out like, what, what is like the hard definition and when, when do we know that there exists one? The, the definition that we use is a new city with um, a uh, basically substantially more uh, a competitive, um legal system with substantial autonomy from the host country mm -hmm. so uh this like what i typically refer to like singapore hong kong shenzhen is in dubai as proto charter cities um because they have a lot of charter city as elements um uh, but right like any sort of i don't know it's not a very strict definition it was com paul romer had a different definition where it would be administered by a different countries so like canada would go into honduras and administer a city and we're, we're not doing that like high income country to minister in a low income country. Um, so there isn't a, like, I don't want to pretend there's a super strict definition. It's, it's kind of like 
um, what is it like porn, you know, when you see it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess I want to get to part two of my question, which Alison brought up. So I, I live in Puerto Rico and um, part, part of the things that attract me to Puerto Rico um, is the economic incentives um, packages that they've made available to companies that move here. So they've made, um, for people that don't know, they've made it very remote work friendly. So if you can export a service, uh, typically working from your computer to anywhere outside of Puerto Rico, you have a 4% corporate income tax here. Um, and they also made, they have a separate law that made capital gains tax very low uh, for people that move here and are willing to donate thousands of dollars to charity. Um, and uh, so I'm curious if, you know, if you're too, if you're familiar much with, with Puerto Rico as I feel like it's probably another one of these pseudo charter cities in a way, although, you know, I don't know if it's a definition of being like new with that intention, but we're in, we're in such a gray area here with the jurisdiction of the federal government that you're actually able to live here as an American city, citizen, retain your passport and actually shrug, um, shrug the, the owing of taxes to the IRS and thus able to deal directly with the Puerto Rican government and so that they can decide on, um, on tax policy to encourage new businesses here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not like super familiar with, with, with uh, Puerto Rico. I've been following it somewhat remotely. I mean, I, I think that that is um, a, an interesting example. What we, what we like to focus on is basically um, more on the regulatory side than on the tax side. Um, right, like taxes are an important determinant of, of human behavior, but over the long run, um, we tend to think that the legal and, and regulatory environment is um, more important. Well, like if you lower tax rates, uh, it, it can stimulate growth. And so one example we sometimes use is like tax havens, right? There's all, only gonna ever be so many tax havens in the world, right? Like if you have five like good tax havens, um, the six doesn't add that much value per se because right like it, it the, the 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 elasticity is is uh so high with respect to um um competition and so but if you look at right like what what led um shenzhen to economic growth it was the liberalization of like labor laws of, of land laws and so um that's what we uh tend to focus on that's not to say right like tax competition is necessarily bad or that uh right like puerto rico um and anything about Puerto Rico is just that, that that's where our focus is. And so I, I think there is the like uh, tax competition to attract people who otherwise might live in the US to Puerto Rico and that could make things um, better for, for, for Puerto Rico. But we don't see that as necessarily, I guess, changing like long-term growth rates, which is uh, what we're primarily interested in. Good, Sean, yeah. All right, then I will take David now. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> okay, you, Sean. It was fine. I just couldn't say anything because I was muted by the host. Um, but yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was really nice to see you, Sean. I hope you have a lovely day. You, you're like even more tan than usual, which is insane. I didn't know it was possible. Okay, next one up, we have uh, we have David. David, I'm gonna unmute you now. I'm. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm just wondering about <clears throat> the whether there's somewhere a really good argument that I can point people to in print about the value of an independent judiciary. It's one of those themes in liberal thought. Um, independent judiciary, you know, doesn't rely on necessarily separating legislative and executive branch, but it's really good to have judges who aren't total crooks, and it's really good to have judges who can't all be fired from their job uh, when the ruling government with authoritarian tendencies is unhappy with the judge's rulings. And then my favorite example is, you know, if the Weimar government uh, had a little bit more stones in the late 20s, they might have kept that Austrian troublemaker in jail who had tried to violently overthrow the government, which you'd think you know, would lead in a liberal democratic state with some stones, just keep someone in jail forever. You know, you try to overthrow and challenge a legitimacy. But anyway, that's that's my favorite example. But I, I'm I'm I don't know where to find that argument in print that would appeal to a broad swathe of people with both classic liberal values and more uh, whatever progressive liberal values. This kind of pan 
spectrum, you know, broad spectrum argument about that, that historical value for preserving rights and stability? Yeah, I mean, the book that comes to mind um, is, uh, what's it called? Uh, um, this book's called uh, The Constitution of Liberty by Hayek, which, um, right, it's like libertarian-ish, but I think most of the arguments have been largely um, uh, adopted. Um, and he's, he's, in my opinion, actually, he's the one who sort of gets rule of law to make a comeback. If you read the literature in like the 50s, not that many people are talking about rule of law and uh, Constitution of Liberty is really what sort of, in a, in a, in, in, to an extent, defines the modern conception of rule of law. Um, I think the, the other aspect is, at least from the sort of charter cities perspective, if you look at, right, um, um, we're, we're less sort of concerned, like we're, we're trying to be apolitical because the uh, political freedoms tend to be more threatening to governments than economic freedoms, right? If you're in an authoritarian country and you say, um, we're going to have elections here, and we're going to have freedom of speech here, the authoritarian country is less likely to allow that than if you say, look, we want a different like set of economic rules, but we're not going to try to threaten your political power. Um, and so because of that, we, we um, but even with that, it just if you look at the impact of like independent judges on um, investment, uh, um, right, that's why it's, uh, Singapore kept the Pri Privy Council as their superior court, because that would reassure the multinationals that investing in Singapore is okay. And we see basically a similar analogy if you're going into markets that don't have courts that typically respect the rule of law, having a separate set of courts that can develop that reputation can make it much more attractive to um, foreign investment. Okay, so pretty much the, the, the libertarians' favorites are are where you think the best arguments are? Um, I don't see Hayek's, uh, I, I mean, there might, be, there might be other arguments, but I, I, uh, I think that the Constitution of Liberty is the, the book that comes to mind as, and it's not really about like independent judiciary per se, it's more like about rule of law as a broad concept, um, but that's, that's, that's the book that comes to mind. Thanks. All right, great. And then uh, next one up, we have uh, Apur. So I will unmute you. And I think you got another a few uh, replies uh, to your questions, David, in the chat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Apur, I'm going to unmute you now. Uh, <laughs> I just muted you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so uh, I'm just curious, like, do you think the relevance of trading routes um, matter here? And how much uh, do you think the opportunity around the Indian Ocean for charter cities and interventions? So I think uh, trading routes are definitely very important, right? If you just look at human settlements, human settlements go where um, trading routes. Um, I don't have a lot of thoughts about the Indian Ocean just because I am not very well read on it. Um, for the people I've spoken with, people who... Uh, um, I trust who do a lot of work in India, and they basically tell me that India is not ready for charter cities. Modi is the most authoritarian president in a generation or two, and he can't even force through a financial center in, I think, um, Mumbai. So they, they also implemented special economic zone reforms in 2005 that were supposedly modeled on the Chinese special economic zone reforms, but they weren't really and failed. And so the, my understanding is the internal Indian narrative is that they've tried this and it didn't work. Um, but I think India, if you get right, because India has so many people and it's such, um, it's got 400 million new urban residents over the next 30 years. So if you can get um, national level legislation in India, I think that could do a, a, a tremendous amount of good. Um, and you also see, for example, the build out, um, China's built out the port in, um, I think it's, it's like H something, I don't know how to pronounce it, in, in Sri Lanka, that now there's this sort of geopolitical dispute because you've got a Chinese state-owned enterprise that's 99 year lease to operate the port and the Singapore uh, and the Sri Lankans uh, don't like it. So I, I, my, my, broadly, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic that that is there is going to be a lot of increased economic activity there and trade routes. Um, I don't have enough knowledge to have really meaningfully specific opinions on it. All right, thank you, Apu. Uh, next one up, we have Mike, and then maybe after Mike, we have time for one more question. Let's see. Okay, Mike, I'm going to unmute you now. Thanks. I was just wondering if you've looked at like alternative taxation schemes. I mean, ideally, it would be best to have no taxes, 
but a good compromise I've seen is like the Georgist model where you're essentially collecting rents on uh, land value in an area. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to, to, to the land value tax. I think it probably is the tax that makes, um, right, like it's the least distortive because it, uh, if you tax something, you get less of it, but you generally don't can't get less of land because there's a fixed amount. So um, in terms of the type of taxes, the type that we typically recommend is, is Georgist. The challenge is that there isn't that much practical experience with um, land value taxation, right? There's sort of a few examples. I think Philly um, or Pittsburgh, you know, in like the 60s and 70s had, had a land value tax. But if you they look at- They considered it in as well for a while. The, um, that's, that would yeah. be useful. Um, yeah, for a while, I think uh, most of the, like, uh, I think in South Ken and Portobello, like uh, a lot of the neighborhoods were kind of abandoned because lots of, uh, I think it was mostly Arab investment that had uh, kind of like invested there, but the liquor stores didn't make any money anymore <laughs> because no one was living there. It was just held as investment. <laughs> so like the whole, like whole neighborhoods were kind of deserted there. It was kind of crazy. Yeah, and I, I, I like to, just to reiterate the point. I, I don't think taxation is necessarily bad. I mean, the government needs to be funded and needs to, to do things, and you want to figure out the most effective mechanism to to do that. So uh, I'm not I'm not sort of a anti-tax libertarian uh, on that for, on that on that note. Okay, we may have time for one more question. Anyone? Um, then I will just ask, what's next for you, Mark? Like, what are your plans now with the Charter Cities Institute? Like, you mentioned that uh, there was like a, a conference. Uh, you know, are you gonna kind of like uh, push more info out? I, I got a, I, I got, I think, an email from your newsletter. I think two days ago, maybe. Um, but you know, what's next for you? How can people get involved? Uh, you know, like, yeah. Well, everything is sort of um, temporarily paused because of COVID. So, what we've done is is pivoted to. Uh, Right, like trying to lay the foundations for uh, charter cities. And this has basically two things. One, just more sort of like general content. So we launched a podcast on Monday. Um, well, that'll be coming out every uh, two weeks, a charter cities podcast. I'm writing a book that hopefully I'll finish later this year and then we can publish next year. Um, uh, we have a, a blog. And then in addition to that, we're drafting what we're calling reference guides or reference documents. So we are drafting a model charter for a charter city. We are drafting model legislation. We are drafting a relatively comprehensive introduction to charter cities. Um, we are drafting a governance handbook. So if you're actually building governance system, governance system from scratch, how do you do that? Uh, and so, right, like basically getting all of the, I guess, sort of legal documents legal framework in place such that when the world turns on again, these are available and we're ready to um, hit the ground running. If you want to get involved, I mean, feel free to shoot me an email, mark at cci.city or on Twitter, cci.city and uh, myself, Mark Lutter, uh, Facebook, um, Charter Cities Institute, LinkedIn, Charter Cities Institute. We have a newsletter. Um, you can find that, uh, sign up to that on our website, chartercitiesinstitute.org. Uh, so we're going to keep putting out content and, and engaging folks. And uh, yeah, we'd love to stay in touch with you guys. All right. Hey, uh, I thank you so, so much for joining. And uh, that was fantastic. Really good questions, everyone. Uh, that was a really, really nice back and forth. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, I'm going to post uh, a little bit more info on how to join those salons. So it's always the same Zoom link. And uh, we're meeting uh, once a day currently. We're still trying to hash out whether it's uh, 9 a.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, and yeah, all past and future salons can be found on the sanity schedule. Um, you can add them to your calendar to keep track of time zones. And uh, the videos are now going to be uploaded to our um, to our website, um, kind of like once a week, I think. And uh, then you can join our mailing list to stay up to date. Uh, I will try to add uh, Mark's slides um, into uh, into the show notes on the sanity schedule. And with that being said, I think I'm going to see. Hopefully many of you tomorrow here for our next salon. And uh, they can all be found on the sanity schedule. Thank you so much, Mark. I can't wait for your book to come out. And um, yeah, happy Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. <laughs>